cannot tell you how incredibly proud I am and excited I am to be um, able to introduce our first um, contributor of the morning. Um, Professor Alex McDowell holds uh, the chair in the William, McKenz William Cameron Menzies chair in uh, the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. That chair is endowed by George Lucas, just so you know. Um, Alex is a raw designer for industry uh, and he runs in my view, one of the most extraordinary institutions in the creative industries anywhere in the world, the World Building Lab um, in Los Angeles. A number of us were privileged to spend a couple of days there um, earlier in the year, and I have to tell you, it changed my life. Um, so it's really extraordinary to be able to introduce Alex to the stage. He will explain some of these things in conversation with me, but he's a futurist, he does, he's a design thinker, he's a storyteller, he sits extraordinarily in the intersection between emerging technology, experiential media, and some really extraordinary large-scale projects. Just so you know, he was the guy who designed Minority Report and spent two years in the process heading a team that designed the future that we all saw in Minority Report, which to some degree has conditioned the future we all now live in. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to welcome to the stage Professor Alex McDowell. Hey Alex, how are you? <laughs> good, good. It's really not fair to ask a pseudo-American with an English accent to go on first with his jet lag. But... With your jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you are a Brit, aren't you? We should start there. Yeah. Um, but you're based in LA. Um, let, shall we start talking about world building as an idea in the sure. World Building Institute? Right. You have, you have, we've got some um, slides that Alex may or may not refer to. I uh, probably will a bit, I, I, I yeah. think, while we talk about this. But one of the, 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 the reasons, apart from it's always a privilege to be anywhere near a stage you're on, um, for bringing you here, was to help us think about ways of thinking about the future. When you're conceiving of your, of your work, when you're inventing your ideas, when you're framing possibility, I personally am a great believer that speculative fiction and world building actually helps us understand the present mm -hmm. much more than many, uh, it is not really about the future. So, so what's world building then and how does it sit in, in, in the, the framework for thinking about the future? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, world building emerged out of me sort of falling off a series of cliffs through my <laughs> career. Right. Um, driven really by the fact that I'm sort of intensely curious and easily bored. Um, so I've moved forward and, and after 30 years of film, um, actually Minority Report was the turning point. Really? Where I was forced to design a world because there was no script. So there was literally no script. So it's, yeah. it's sort of based on a Philip K. Dick story, but there was right. nothing when you started. There was nothing, yeah. Wow. Uh, that's not strictly true. There was, there was a half-page synopsis that Stephen had written. Okay. Um, and really that was a provocation. It was, it was you know, Washington DC 2050 and three precogs in the center as a disruptor. And the whole world really emerged from that provocation at the beginning. Wow. And so the, the method for building the world then, well, how do you go about that? You sit in a room, put a towel over your head and write it with a pencil? I mean, what was the process? No, it's, um, you know, it was, it was driven by him, Steven Spielberg, asking a couple of things. One, one was that he wanted it to be um, future reality, not science fiction. Okay. Um, and then to open the doors in the real world to go out and do sort of intense research. But not familiar in the film industry where you would tend to just huddle and read books, that we actually had to go and meet a lot of people out in the world. Okay. So if I think back and I remember autonomous vehicles, I think I encountered as a concept for the first time in that movie and personalized advertising, you know, ads following Tom Cruise up an escalator, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. How did that, how, how, who was talking about those things back in the day when you were thinking about that world? Well, we, we were talking to architects, right. um, Greg Lynn and Frank Geary, for example, who were sort of at the front edge of architecture. In fact, we had to hire an architect into the art department because there was nobody in the film industry, in the art departments, who had the capability of designing buildings for the future okay. because they were basically drawing on a drawing board. So do they um, have to work? They have to be true and true, these buildings? They have to be 
conceived of as a natural progression from the present, I would say. Okay. And I think there's a big part of that, the architectural, which is you don't expect things to change dramatically. Um, you know, we're still living in buildings that are three, four, five hundred years old. Yep. Um, but we have to have a sort of presence of new buildings. So architecture was, was one piece. Um, but we also went out into MIT Media Lab. We went to Apple Labs. We went to DARPA, the, um, the military defense laboratories. And, and we had this access. It was a fantastic opportunity. Right. And our job was really to just ask questions. And those questions gave us clues. You know, we saw the first kind of two inch square of molecules of ink that could be magnetically or negatively attracted to the surface, which was essentially the basis of the Kindle. Right. But it was flexible and we could imagine that that would become a surface. Um, we saw sort of early Amazon where it was, if you like this, you'll like that. And we posited that that was going to be the future of targeted advertising. Right. So we had all of these clues. Um, the the um, vertical car, the maglev car, came from just um, architects telling us that the height of buildings is constrained by the number of elevators that they can contain. Oh. Um, so that kind of triggered a whole, co a whole conversation between us, which was how might you increase the number of elevators to get this very tall city? Right. And what if they were on the outside of the building and what if they could uh, move intelligently Right. around the building to where they were required, and also what if they were furniture. Um, and, and the other piece was how did Tom Cruise get to work in the morning. And so those two combined became an <laughs> autonomous vehicle right. um, in the year 2000. Um, and so we've been sort of lauded in a way with the idea that Minority Report predicted the future in all of these ways. There's like 16 million hits on the web if you look, look that up. Yeah. Um, but it was really not that we were really not being so clever. We were just listening carefully. And I think that's the fundamental part of research for us. Is listening. And yeah. did you conceive of it as world building um, to begin with? I think we need a clicker on stage, please, team. Did you conceive of it as world building as an idea? Did, did you think of it as, uh, as, as that? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, laptop problem. Excuse us. Un <laughs> laptop unlocking in process. Now, can you all see my code? I was sort of imagining you would look at it and it would automatically know <laughs> your you. face. Was that just me? Yeah, if only. Yeah. Um, did you think of it in a, as a paradigm of world building at that point? Had that become a notion that you were building a world? No, I think we only really kind of took stock of that uh, when the film came out. Right. Two years later, we went, hold on. We've done this has thing. flipped the model, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, and, did, and that's then led you to the world building sort of frame of reference almost. Yeah. Which is, um, I think, it, so you've got some slides I think we could talk through about how that works for people who aren't familiar with uh, the, the kind of methodology and the, the way of thinking. Is that yeah, a maybe good I thing for us to do? Yeah, do a quick Yeah, do a little quick overview. overview of that. That'd well, be helpful. Um, okay, well, so it's coming yes. up behind but not on our monitors, this, I think. But yeah, world building, the, the process really was us kind of taking stock, as I say, and reflecting back on how we had done it. Right. And then I was being asked to talk about it in, for a conference in Finland, and I was like, what am I going to talk about? And on the plane, I sketched out this, this kind of diagram of the nonlinear process that I think had come directly out of um, the questions we were asking, that we, okay. couldn't, we couldn't really do a linear process in a script-based way because there was no script. Right. We had to think about holistic world. Um, and that turned into... Have we got this? It's up here. It's up here, but we can't see it. But it's not up there. Okay. They're working. <laughs> so so, that, but, so that, that turned into the idea of building a world. You and I, we, we, we talked about this a couple of times before, but that way of thinking feels quite theatrical to me. It feels... Mm. I mean, that's obviously where I'm from, so sort of to me, in a way, everything is a nail. If you give me a theatrical hammer, I'll hit it. Mm. Um, mm. It feels like a rehearsal room. It feels like a kind of iterative process under which you build a piece of work that, that is um, more traditionally done in theatre that way. It's not really done in movies and TV in the same way. A you little know, I bit. Th I, th I think that what we discovered over maybe in the first seven years as we were kind of asking these questions is that design transcends the silos and that it's one okay. of those... Um, you know, as, as somebody who's at, the, at least a designer in this through line of falling off cliffs, yeah. um, 
although Malcolm Garrett will attest to the fact that I was a lousy designer at the beginning <laughs> of my <laughs> career. Um, but um, oh, I lost my thread. It's Malcolm's fault. It, um, it probably is. Yeah. Many things are. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yes, it's a design it, process. Right. So it's a design process, and I've I've been lucky to just be involved in a tiny bit of theatre. But it really opened my eyes to the fact that it is, you know, the the way it evolves, the way it comes together through um, kind of an intuitive relationship between the major creators, yep. kind of a jazz yep. um, ensemble. Um, it, it does resemble the front end of, of film as well. The, the, the kind of writing and designing end? Well, I think in the design space, I mean, there's okay. an argument in a way about where writing comes that I would still say that the script should at least be parallel to design and, or even after. Right. Um, but, but you are in that completely improvisational space at right. the beginning of a film. There's really, there's nothing that a script tells the designer really other than what you're framing, you know, what are you going to be um, uh, wrapping around the narrative and the actors. Right. But other than that, you really start from scratch. So in that process then, the kind of, the, the, the way you set out, the way you, the way you start the journey is really crucial. How you frame the question, how you frame where you're going to begin, because yes. you don't know where you're going to end up, obviously, but how you set out feels very essential. Yeah. So you described that in Minority Report. So while we're, while we're dealing with the joy of HDMI cables or whatever's happening over there, in, in other worlds, because there have been many projects and you're still doing lots of them, really fascinating ones, mm -hmm. how do you frame the, 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 the essay question? How do, you, how do you frame what the objectives are and what the parameters of the question are? Well, I think it's a combination. I think that one listens carefully to the brief, you know, and then one rejects it completely. Correct. And, yes. and starts to um, arrogantly sort of replace it with... with um, so you take, a, you know, you take the, the hint of it, but yeah. I think that um, it is our job as creative um, folks to, to challenge from the beginning, to create provocations, essentially. Um, our central provocation in, in world building is what if and why not. Right. Um, so I think that's a challenge of, of any brief that comes in. But nevertheless, I think a brief is a seed. And, and you, you begin in this kind of low resolution, iterative, pro iterative process. And then as you increase resolution, so the narrative comes together. Right. Um, I think that's the, the ideal. So you move from iteration to prototyping. Yep. Um, that I would call design visualization. And then into an actually repetitive prototyping as you discover things. And you so so who's back. in the room then? Because uh, I've been in uh, a couple of days in, in your lab and, and I, I think we've, we've had this conversation. I'm a, sort of, I'm a design process skeptic to some degree, mm. except I found the process in your room extraordinarily enlightening and exciting. So how do you curate, I'm, I'm going to try and avoid the word curate because it's overused, but mm. how do you cast the room? How do you ensure that you know, there, there, there are so many points of view but not too many? How do you get the, the, the shared vocabulary to work in the room? Because mm. these are hard things to do, aren't they? They are. I think, I think that, though, I don't think there can be too many people in the room. There can't be too many. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, if you, you do need to cast who they are in a way because you're trying to, um, you're trying to gather knowledge, you're trying to become informed. You know, we start every project as the most ignorant people in the room. And so we have a lot to learn. And in order to learn what we need to create a holistic world, which is an essential part of this nonlinear process, yeah. it, the world we create asks, interrogates itself in a way. There are millions of questions you have to ask. Um, and in order to start filling that out, you need a range of experts. So they don't all have to be in the room at the same time. Uh -huh. um, and I think there is a core design team that sets up the kind of basic research that allows you to understand what questions to ask. Yeah. But then you have to gather people to that. And so, I mean, that's, that's both extraordinarily confident and really humble at the same time. You have, to, you, know, you have to know you can lead and you have to know you can shape, but you've also got to be willing to sit back and absorb and not try and control. And that's yes. a very, very difficult thing to do, surely. Well, I, th I think that one of the things that we have found about world building, and it doesn't seem to have yet reached a sort of edge, um, is that when you start off asking questions and you do listen carefully, 
Um, whatever your intention was at the beginning, we've never yet, I think I've built about 70 worlds in the, in the frame that we've been working, we've never yet had a world that turned out the way we, in, uh, we intended or anticipated, let's say. Because I think you don't, I mean, the, one of the problems I have now with clients when we're, when we're being paid to do commercial work is that we say, no, we can't tell you what you're going to get at the end. Yeah. And that's difficult to, <laughs> to get the client to gather to. But we've, we've been able to do it by doing these kind of early prototypes and let them understand. But that, that's a, a big part of world building is that the listening carefully is about the knowledge you need. And only as you gather knowledge do you even find out what medium you're working in. You know, we, we very much say that we're platform and media agnostic because there's no... Um, it would only constrain us. So, in, in the absence of your pictures, as it looks like where we are, um, could you... Which is just fine. Yeah. Give us a couple of examples, which is fine, yeah. Give us a couple of examples of, of worlds you feel, you know, which you can explain without visualising necessarily, but that, that you feel characterise um, the, the world-building process or that have been the most surprising projects you've been mm, involved mm. in? You know, is there such a range? You're working with Ford at one end and the Inuit nation at the other, and I mean, these are not ends, that's, mm, that's not mm. the wrong way of describing it, but a huge range of kind of um, clients, collaborators, participants. Yeah. A couple of examples to just f flesh it out a bit for us. Well, if I would just talk about the projects we're engaged in right now. Yeah. Ford is one, we've been a couple of years with them. Uh, we're working with two um, indigenous tribes or rather uh, a whole number of tribes in Alaska, really actually for the, for the whole tribal system. Okay. Um, their question was how can their youth um, start looking towards the future? And the future's a huge part of what being asked, we're being asked to do now. Um, we're working with the American Society of um, Engineers, civil engineers, right. um, conceiving right now of five cities that are, that are imagined 25, 25 years out and 50 years out. Um, we're working with the Alaska education system. So looking at the whole of higher education in Alaska, working directly with the president who has a vision that he wants to express over the next 20 years. So how did, he, how did that come about? What, what's the question you get asked? He was, I mean, it, it's, it's very, it's kind of incestuous in that we are, we, we don't go out and pitch work, really. We get sort of recommended by one to the other. And so in that case, um, the tribe, the, the cook in the tribal council, um, invited the president, um, Jim Johnson, to one of our workshops. Right. And then as he saw that we were looking into the future, he said, what about looking into our future? So it was kind of that simple. But okay. then we had to listen carefully to his vision, which is very, very well thought out. Um, but involves a complete shift because Alaska is actually very disadvantaged. There's, there's a huge problem of getting high school students to move into higher education. Right. And so we did this, we are still doing, and we're right in the middle of it, looking at how there's a cyclical connectivity that doesn't really exist now from K-12 up through higher education that train teachers that go back into K-12, but but are being driven by the future of work. So the, the kind of industries that we do not yet know are going, uh -huh. are going to evolve. We have to imagine that in 20 years, they're going to have an enormous influence over what's being taught. And so we, we imagine completely new programs. Those programs, as I say, influence teachers, but everyone going out into industry. Right. Industry starts ingesting interns. That in turn changes the education system. So it's a, you, 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 your foundation is, is systemic thi or systems thinking. I think design, systems design. Systems is, design thinking. Is, it, it's, storytelling is, is the through line always. Yeah. But I think the framework within which the story exists is really important. So and how, that's the systems piece. And that's the systems piece. So it, with, okay, so that's really interesting. So I've seen, the, I've seen some of the work with Ford. And, and that is kind of, it's huge in scope. Um, so uh, how did that come about? And what's the, I think we might get some images in a moment, but what's, oh, cool. the, what's the sort of, what's the scope? How did, they, how did that come about? How do you address a, a sort of client of that size mm. um, at the same time as having the tool set to address the Alaskan indigenous nations? Well, again, we were very lucky that uh, Jim Hackett, who's the current CEO, 
was supporting the conference that I ran for a few years, yeah. um, the World Building Conference. And he also had a vision but, and, and was finding it difficult to um, socialize within the company to some extent, which okay. is, of course, a very traditional 100 years industry, 100 year old industry. Um, and he is doing some revolutionary stuff, like saying Ford shouldn't necessarily build cars, um, which is relatively... It's pretty revolutionary true. for a man who runs a car company, isn't it? Yeah. So he doesn't, actually, in a way, he doesn't think he does run the most automobiles company anymore. Well, I think he thinks that the evolution of, say, autonomous vehicles is going to have such a dramatic effect. Right. But it's mostly going to have a dramatic effect on cities. Right. And so our project is to look at the city of tomorrow, um, both from systems view, like how does the intelligent city interact with the intelligent with smart mobility? Right. Um, and so you can sort of see the the wiring of that, yes. the, the kind of uh, co the connectivity that is coming, um, is coming. Yeah. the sort of Internet of Things at city scale. Um, but also, what we're really interested in is the street level view, the human view. How does that giant system and that shifting city? really affect the human and and actually how do people on the street make demands on that system right um, because they're more empowered we are all more empowered than we've ever been right so looks like we have access to oh, okay. this i don't know if we have a clicker or whether i do you do yeah. so assuming uh, let's see if that works that would be, okay. be amazing if it does and then talk, there's and a couple then talk of through there are a couple projects, of things in here yeah. about world building more generally, aren't there? In a couple of projects. Yeah. So let's yeah. let's let's just uh, give you a few moments, a few minutes to just yeah. um, you know do your thing. Um, I'll quickly mention though, in in relation to the Ford project, which is massive cities, um, I'm working in my research lab at the at the school at USC on a project that's about as far away from that as could be, which is designing a semantic language for the pancreatic beta cell. Right, um, that's not a sentence I expected to hear. Um, <laughs> and I'm working with the pancreatic... Unpack that a bit for me. <laughs> our, our client is, kind of, is the pancreatic beta cell consortium, and who knew that there and was a consortium? everything as well. Who knew there was a thing? Exactly. That? Okay. Um, but the, the person leading that project is an amazing doctor, professor, who came to USC because of the School of Cinema. So he's... Really? He's a, enormously successful medical, you know, molecular biologist. And his premise is that what's missing from science is storytelling. Right. And so he, I had a conversation with him and I asked him, um, what's the comparative scale between a pancreatic beta cell and its human equivalent? And he said, a single cell is about equivalent to a major city. Okay. And, and so we were kind of handed the metaphor, which was to say, well, in that case, what if we use the metaphor of cities that we intuitively understand, although it's an incredibly complex system, you know, my young kids could go out in the city and work their way how to get around. Right. Um, so we used that city metaphor and said, well, what if you use, you know, what if it is a protein is a, is a inhabitant or, or different scales of protein are inhabitants, and inhabitants or architecture and they work within an infrastructure and there's cause and effect and the delivering of messages and um, there's a kind of context that you can begin to understand right. and then we developed a, a visual component essentially a volumetric series of models that represented those moving parts which which actually turned out to be that origami was the common language between molecular biologists and architects, because both <laughs> understood folding, essentially. <laughs> okay. This is um, a bit where I do that thing my 12-year-old does and go, <laughs> okay. But it's been so origami and pancreatic, pancreatic yeah. beta cells. Yeah, Every so, time I meet you, you do something else that blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, you know, fascinating to us, because it's yeah, not, yeah. it is creative, you know, okay, it is clearly. storytelling. Yeah. Um, and it's a huge discovery on both sides, you know, on the science side and the design, the art side, where we were looking at each other blankly for six months, going, "How about this? No, how right. about that?" And had no understanding of our. And it came. Language. It came from, it came from sort of. It feels like it came from melting the boundary and, and just looking for the, the common share. Thing. I think that's a huge part of this. I think that creating platforms that allow people who do not speak each other's language together around yeah. a common space yeah. um, is 
kind of fundamental. Yeah. I found, when I was in your lab, I found myself next to a philosopher, a statistician, uh, a, a, a code genius, and somebody else, and somebody from the sort of quasi sort of movie side, but who wasn't in any way a movie person. Yeah. And it took us. It was extraordinarily fascinating to meet those people. And then you set a question that, again, was entirely... Well, not even, you didn't set a question. We explored a question which made us all think we were slightly off kilter and all look for a way of sort of balancing together. And about four hours in, we were doing it. Yeah. And I thought that was an extraordinary thing to be able to pull off with, the, with this range of people, uh, many of whom had sort of were, uh, were experienced or expert in their areas. Yeah. And so melting the kind of the sort of shell of, of, of expertise, the sort of shell of, um, not lack of collaboration, but the, the difficulty of being open is something that the way you all went about it mm -hmm. was really phenomenally successful at for me. And I think it came from the thinking. I don't know if, we, if it's worth looking at the model yeah. to yeah. some extent, how you think about it, the sort of reflexive systems where you think, sure. which I think was fascinating. This diagram I've seen before. And right. Is it visible from up there? Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can skim through this. This, sure. is, this is a very stupid, um, simplified version of, of storytelling, but I think it... It speaks to the point, um, which is that storytelling was initially designed to make sense of the world around us. It evolved because there was a need to explain the unexplainable, um, those things in the shadows, that silver disc crossing the sky that turns into a princess in a chariot, and, yeah. and the metaphors that evolved from that were fundamentally survival systems. So. First of all, they were the product of a collective knowledge, a collect collective gathering of knowledge to make sense of the world, and then um, formed a language and a system to be able to pass that knowledge down through generations, where it was added to and it was cumulative and evolutionary. Um, and that was a fantastic sort of oral tradition, which still exists in, in many indigenous tribes, but completely got lost in the West when Gutenberg slammed the printing press down in front of us mm -hmm. and, um, and everything became author-driven, essentially. So we've suffered, to some extent, um, 600 years of waiting to be told, you know, sitting in the audience with a proscenium relationship to the creator or right. to, the, um, to the author. Um, and, you know, in this diagram, you kind of go through the artist, the, the, the author, the designer, the auteur, the director, the star architect, all of those are people who've been put in a position of uh, expertise, you know, the sort of top of the, of the um, pyramid. Um, and what was really interesting for us is the first, the first project I was given, having come into USC as this kind of notion of world builder, was Intel coming in and asking us in a research space to um, challenge their chips, to right. build something that was going to fundamentally um, shift their thinking around the, the next evolution of, of the chip um, of computation. And so we, we had come into the 2012 relatively early um, investigation around the mix, mixed reality tools. Sure. And stepping inside VR immediately required us to think different about storytelling. Right. And it was really clear that Sleep No More was a much better analogy. Theater was a much better analogy for, or a much better framework for, for storytelling within the world building um, space for mixed reality right. than cinema or TV or any of the linear screen-based media. And so we were looking for, we're still looking really for ways to evolve the kind of storytelling that can and should exist in a holistic world space in a spherical world, which is essentially what VR is. Yeah. Um, you know, we look at jazz, for example, you know, where there is no single author, where it's completely intuitive, instinctive, evolutionary. That's much closer to the process. And so world building really got honed um, into a multiply influenced, multi-storyteller space, which to my mind kind of takes the circle back to tribal, that we're really, we've right. moved and we are now in the evolution of tribal storytelling, and it's not even an evolution because it's really looking back at the, 
at the history to global narrative and to tribal storytelling again. Right, right, right. And I think world building becomes this space. It's kind of a base of research and knowledge gathering, um, but it becomes knowledge transfer in the same way as passing uh, stories through through generations. Right. So there's a sort of there's a sort of celebration of complexity in in a lot of your work. And sort of you know the the, the notion that there is a simple authorial position. It's still very interesting in other ways. And in another context, both of us and differently have worked with one of the great cinematic world-building authors in Terry Gilliam. And if yeah. you work with Terry, you're working in a world all the time, which is a world that's somewhere in the back of Terry's head. But um, when those sorts of creatives operate in, say, theatre in my case, or they, they tend to bring what they're used to. They tend to yes. bring that kind of authorial linearity or that precision, which is important in those disciplines, but be less interested in the complexity of circular storytelling, the complexity of systems. Um, because it isn't really where they've sort of cut their teeth. Yeah, yeah. So how do you merge? The, do you merge? I mean, what, you've, you've other things in here about the prototypes, so we'll come back to the question. But, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. World building is, 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 a, is a tool set. It's a way of approaching questions. It's not a, it's not a team, is it? It's a, you sort of, I feel like I'm slightly an alumnus from a couple of days of the idea without being you know, part of a, of a... I'm not part of a cult or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a way of thinking. Um, it That's is, and it's a way of thinking that's con completely enabled by what's happening now. So we're in this in maybe the most disruptive period in history in terms of how little we know about what's ahead of us, and yet how much we know about the capability of it changing. Right. So on the whole, the people we work with are people who understand that things are changing to such an extent that they cannot begin to predict what's going to happen to them. Right. Um, and so this kind of idea that when everything is changing, the, the uncertainty, the chaos, if you like, which is where we thrive um, as creatives, enables us to um, really break the model and start thinking about how you, for example, in a collaborative uh, collective sort of socialist world space of, of thinking completely differently how you can actually prototype the future um, whether it's 10 15 20 50 years out there is a there is a kind of natural evolution of thinking when it's completely embedded in present reality or history you know we're dealing with an arc of time the future doesn't exist alone as you were saying it's um, the historical context is really important. Right. So delving deeply into the kind of research process which involves all of these questions we ask of the experts, whether they are academics or high school students who are equally expert and probably more so than most adults, um, that, that all of those people bring to the table this the solutions to something that individually they couldn't begin to couldn't predict. Themselves. And then you make, you kind of instantiate and you prototype and you test and you develop. Um, and and, and that, that, that's clearly, that's, that has become, uh, uh, over the last decade or so, that's become the way we think about artistic and, commercial, and creative creativity yeah. in a way it sort of wasn't in the auteur model. The sort of suffering in a garret with a Gitan sort of roman post-romantic art model. Yeah. This is inherently collaborative way of thinking, um, an inherently um, um, complex, it is a complex way of running, of running your life. Yeah. We are slightly surrounded by people who are suggesting that there are simplicities and uh, ways of running the world that are not complex and that it is able to, we can reduce things to bina binaries, etc. Um, mm. I think it's impossible to tell stories now in that, in in that, that way, way, actually. Um, you know, we've been conditioned in the same way as we were conditioned by the single author. We've been conditioned by a Victorian industrial process that was linear, you know, that passed the knowledge down and it expected it to be adapted by disconnected series of people right. on the production line. Um, and it's completely irrelevant now, I think. I mean, the, the biggest enemies we all have are PowerPoint and Excel. Really. Well, we found that just early on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's extraordinary. Um, you know, Expel, the, the spreadsheet kills the creative process because it doesn't correspond in any way to the way we think. It's entirely linear. Right. Um, and so some of these things, you know, need to be disrupted fundamentally. But in the meantime, 
the shift, I think, and as, as we start collaborating across silos, specifically in the art science space, where there's a real interesting tension that can, you know, pull stories out that have never existed. Right. Um, that's only possible if you have artists and scientists. So that, that uh, but also I think it, it elevates is the wrong word, but I think the creative process that have been considered the artist in the garret, you know, the kind of, you know, crazy, unpredictable yeah. individual types. A is completely not true. I mean, I think artists over for the last thousand years have understood quantum physics fundamentally, for example. You know, Picasso was dealing with quantum. Cubism oh, go on, unpack quantum. that a bit. How was Picasso <laughs> dealing with quantum? I like well, that. I think that it's the idea of a simultaneity of viewpoints okay. for existence right. or, or the ability to, to imagine simultaneous events through time, right. distributed across time. Um, I, I think that it's, that therefore, I think that the creative is more as useful to the scientist in that case, because we have a real, so we kind of have to bring the creative process into that idea of balance and not these crazy folks over here, but that we do work within complex systems. Right. We always have, right. and those complex systems are incredibly important and that art now actually the creative process and i think this is what's so great about what you're doing drives the future of engineering technology because it makes demands on it right. and i think now we're sort of in a space where we can think about that and so this idea of us being fundamentally um disruptive is really about that what if why not challenge right, right. um and yeah have so you got a, a, a couple of other things here yeah yeah i'll go quickly here so this is the sort of idea of a container of narrative. Um, and, and this is sort of fundamental to the research process, to the idea that, and I'll just work the way through it, um, we start off as we develop a world in this mandala space, which is basically a slice through a sphere and is, is asking questions around all of the parts, is we start off in, in scale. So the, ex, the, the outer line is context. How, the where are we, what, you know, where are we, when are we? Right. Um, the difference between being on Mars or in 16th century Paris, you know, the, the context completely changes storytelling. And then we move through um, the metaphors of the, the city, the neighborhood, the street corner, the, 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 the group um, or the family, all the way through to the individuals. So this is, um, oh. ooh, this is a blank screen. Hang on. That's interesting. Oh, here we go. Um, so we, we occupy this space with these kind of high level um, uh, ecologies. And each of these is necessary to storytelling. It always has been, really. But how do you understand the world in terms of what energies it, does it need to receive? What, how is it governed? What is its infrastructure? How does it evolve culturally? And as you move through the, to the center of the space where the individual resides um, in terms of scale, you have contextualized the narrative around that one or many individuals. Mm -hmm. And then you push them back out into the world and they start demanding their own questions. So these can be meta characters, but you have to solve the framework of the world around them. I see. And so the, the storytelling, you know, the, the high level of those ecologies doesn't change very much. Those questions are fundamental and high level. But as the, as the character moves back through all of these tiny, illegible um, black and white words uh, adapt completely to the kind of story that's being told. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, absolutely makes sense. And so it's a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a map of competencies, capabilities, challenges. It, it's, it's a way of um, describing the, the, the entire landscape. And then your, your kind of lenses are on the side. Lenses will be familiar to many of us from sort of game design theory as much as anything else, and, 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 the, and broader user-centric design theory. But this bring, the and this brings lenses into um, a sort of very holistic context, yeah. which I think is unusual. I don't think I've seen it, apart from in your work, I, I haven't seen it represented in this way. That may be that I haven't seen it. Um, um, who, uh, who do you look to, to to challenge you? Because, I mean, you spend a great amount of time doing wonderfully exciting and challenging projects. But, you know, what do you read? Who do you meet? 
where, where do you find your inspiration and challenge? Because we've four or five minutes to go. I sort of oh, want probably, to know okay. more about yeah. sort of where you, where you get your fuel from. Well, I think because we start ignorant, it's actually everybody. You know, when we when we do this this project that we that we've been running called the Street Corner, where we're trying to find the microcosm of the city, like the, then we gather people and ask them, you know, what it, what is their memory of a street corner, for example, and each of the people in the room are the world's leading experts on their own street corner. <laughs> um, and they're always surprising. You know, what every person that comes to the table is delivering information that we don't necessarily know, and certainly the others around the table don't know. And so you're constantly getting this idea of surprising one another, provoking one another. And, and that, in turn, I mean, that's why I think the multiple author, the, the holistic world combined with any number of authors, is so powerful. If you take that, first of all, the ingestion of knowledge and the, and the research and development base, right. um, and, and then as you move it out into the world, um, the demands it makes on your, on your knowledge um, is provocative and evolutionary, and, and it really does solve problems, and then the center of that is fiction. So this is the other tricky thing when, when we deal with commercial clients is saying, actually fiction is the way we're going to move all of this right. forward, but, it, but it's not futurism and it's not um, following trends or scenario building so much. It's really saying, um, where would you like to be? On what horizon would you like to see yourselves? And then often moving towards an aspirational future, almost never dystopian, right. but creating this world out there and then thread it back to the present and use that to redirect your intent your from intent. the present towards and, and people can take their own ownership then of that process and take it where they wish. Yeah, very often you're really giving them the tools just to take it from there on So out. You're, you're, you've been extraordinarily helpful to us in the Clusters programme and in, in, in the wider audience of the Future programme and the audience of the Future programme as well and you're specifically engaged with us in Future Screens NI so you're just um, the, 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 there's, a world, there's going to be a world, world building project as part of the, the Clusters programme is it come, going to come from Belfast? What's going to happen? Yeah, well I can't help myself you know it just turns <laughs> into some way or other it always turns into world building but yeah the Ulster project is fascinating and working um, with that team, with Paul, and, to, and, and, you know, kind of dealing with incredibly sensitive and complicated issues, historical, present, and how to project into the future, and how do you create new relationships and new ways of people, not just in the creative process of gathering around and collaborating, but how does that become uh, something that's infective, uh, uh, infecting the, the, next, um, the next people who engage. The really important experts are the participants who you're, you know, or, or the, the people who inhabit the world that you're actually dealing with. So um, we're doing a project at school now at the USC looking at the future of Skid Row, which I don't know if is, an, is a known space, but probably the biggest concentration and the longest um, space of, of homelessness. Um, so in the center of LA, you know, 20 minutes away from the middle class, yep. kind of very wealthy USC, is, is imp impoverished homelessness to the extent that it falls way below the UN's bottom line for refugee camps. So how do you engage a community like that and ask them to think about a 15 year future um, is a very delicate process. Absolutely. And it involves, you know, Trust and but the storytelling is inherently in, in that inside that uh, relationship. So I could talk to you all day um, and learn in every sentence. So um, we've come to the end of our of our slot. You're staying around, I think, all yes. day. So Alex staying around all day. I, it, it's it's wonderful to meet um, somebody who can stretch from a commercial activity with Ford about the future of cities to Skid Row and Northern Ireland and, um, and, and interesting um, projects where we're looking at social value and cultural value as well as in the commercial side. But it all sits on the way you think about it, doesn't it? It all sits on this set of tools. I think so. And, and this in turn is driven by every group of experts who comes to it. And that's the fundamental thing is that it's really just this container, this, this shell that has context, is holistic, 
demands that one thinks about all of the aspects of the world, but only gets populated by the people who are deeply engaged in its outcome. Alex, you're always extraordinarily inspiring, um, and you're Im immensely generous with your time and your expertise. Uh, we're out of time, I'm afraid, but um, can we, um, can we um, express our uh, thanks for <laughs> Professor Thank Alex